Good morning morning. to our uh, three presidents and CEOs of our public library systems and also uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, Is Colette with us? Do you want to join the panel? Okay, Uh, so when they finish testifying, you'll uh, go up on the panel. Okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, And then you'll be sworn in. So I want to welcome everyone today to our joint oversight hearing with the Committee on Immigration regarding the role of public libraries in support of immigrant New Yorkers. Uh, My name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I'm chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. And I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, chair of the Committee on Immigration, uh, who is such an amazing leader and champion on these issues uh, for uh, being a part of this important hearing today. And uh, I think we all know and appreciate the role that public libraries play in uh, serving and empowering immigrant communities in all five boroughs. And I am uh, always proud of the work that the Brooklyn Public Library, the New York Public Library, and the Queens Public Library do and have been doing really for decades. But uh, in these perilous times where so many are uh, being vilified and attacked, it is even more important than ever that we go further uh, and libraries dig deeper and think uh, further about how much more we can do uh, to serve immigrant communities. Uh, Because I've always believed that uh, if we are proud to call ourselves a sanctuary city, which we are, uh, our public libraries were the original sanctuary in this city long before we even adopted that moniker. Uh, Our public libraries were doing that work um, and proudly serving in that capacity before anyone even realized it or gave libraries credit for that. Um, So uh, the services are many, and we'll hear from the uh, presidents and CEOs, but uh, just some include the Immigrant Justice Corps. Uh, We're under the supervision of experienced immigration attorneys. Individuals can seek information and referrals to trusted immigration specialists for help in filing applications for uh, temporary protected status, TPA, naturalization, deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, work permits, permits, visas, and violence against women, uh, VAWA petitions. Uh, Libraries also offer special programming, such as the New Americans Corners program uh, that are located in uh, every branch. And of course, the Queens Public Library's New Americans program was born over 40 years ago, and uh, something that uh, uh, we should all be very proud of. Uh, Obviously, there's assistance. with uh, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, And uh, there's so much uh, more that we can do. Additionally, of course, uh, free library workshops provide information about the rights of immigrant New Yorkers and an overview overview of services uh, such as IDNYC's uh, New York City's Municipal ID card. And we can't talk about IDNYC NYC without talking about the role that libraries, our public libraries played in making it as successful as it is. Um, We could not have uh, done it without the cooperation of libraries. And I want to salute my colleague, uh, Chairman Chaka, of course, uh, whose uh, work on that uh, made history in the city of New York. Um, Action NYC, an immigration legal screening service, and NY citizenship. Uh, We Speak NYC, which I'm interested to learn more about, uh, and NYC Care, a healthcare access program that guarantees low-cost and no-cost services to New Yorkers who do not qualify for or cannot afford health insurance. Um, Finally, as I know well, and I think all of us appreciate, the library serves as a cultural center, uh, providing forums for music, drama, dance, poetry, storytelling, arts and crafts for new immigrants, Uh, uh, who have come to the United States while maintaining and celebrating the rich ethnic history that contributes to the wonderful cultural diversity that is New York City. Um, Today we're here to learn about the services and programs for immigrants in Brooklyn, Queens, and the New York Public Library uh, system. But 
We also uh, want to talk about uh, how libraries uh, are the trusted space uh, and how we can better serve immigrant communities and enhance partnerships with community-based organizations and how the city can support these efforts in a time that is dire for many immigrant communities and families. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, the committee's finance analyst, Alia Ali, our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Nell Beekman. And I would like to now turn it all over to my co-chair and friend, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca. Uh, buenos dias to everyone, and thank you to my uh, amigo and hermano, uh, Chair Van Bramer. The work that we do and we've done before, and this is not the first time that we've had a joint hearing, um, when we can bring the conversation around immigrants and the kind of cultural energy of the city together, some beautiful things happen. And IDNYC, as, as a program, and the incredible execution that the administration has done, really with the support of your vision that cultivated so much connection to the cultural uh, institutions and the libraries. I think that's one of the magical things about this card. And I know you helped so much uh, to ensure that everybody was at the table. So thank you for that. And so what I want to do is, is really kind of bring us um, uh, and connect us to the work that the Immigration Committee has been doing for a while now um, as we talk about the libraries. The committee continues to explore many dimensions of the everyday lives of immigrant New Yorkers. We've held hearings on language access in city agencies and accessing legal services, existing mental health support, and our municipal ID card, the IDNYC, a card intended to simplify the very act of entering government buildings, among other things. At a time when our communities are under attack, by a vicious and overly white supremacist federal administration, we need trusted and safe public spaces more than ever to convene, to share information, and to provide resources. With over 200 branches citywide, our libraries quite, uh, quietly serve this powerful role within our neighborhoods. It is, in fact, the libraries uh, who are the critical component of civic life. They provide democratic uh, platforms to share knowledge in more than just written form. For example, many of the city's libraries host citizen classes, English conversation classes, uh, family cultural events, adult literacy courses for adults. And as we prepare for the 2020 census, the city has invested $1.4 million in the three library, library systems for a coordinated census effort. This will allow New Yorkers to complete their census online at their local library branch. The three library systems also offer the New American Corners, the chair mentioned, uh, NAC, uh, which is a dedicated program serving immigrants by creating a space to provide materials and informational resources on citizenship and other immigration-related topics of interest, partnering with the USCIS and MOYA. The, this program offers study materials and online resources to help individuals prepare for the US history and civics questions and the citizenship exam. NAC also offers workshops of New York City services such as NY, IDNYC, uh, Action NYC, NYC Citizenship, NYC Care, and We Speak NYC, as well as information about public charge and ICE. And importantly, in this time of increased immigration enforcement and fear among immigrant communities, the Immigrant Justice Corps provides immigration screening services and referrals to immigration specialists through city libraries. Libraries hold a special place in my heart. As a child, uh, and I'm just actually, before I tell my story, I just, I, loved hear, I love hearing Chair Van Bramer's stories about him working in the libraries. Um, I wanna see pictures, if there's pictures, it'd be kinda cool there's to kinda see you. There's a lot of pictures. Okay, I wanna see some of them. Um, I can't give you this picture, but I will ex describe it to you. So as a child, I remember my mother dropping me off at our local library in uh, El Paso, Texas. And we, uh, I remember going together with my mom, and this was a Head Start program that she was dropping me off. And she said, you know, mijo, you have to learn English. And that was like her only send off. She was like, this is why you're gonna go to this place, to this library, you're gonna learn English. And I had not spoken English. Um, Spanish was my first language. And there I go uh, with a Superman uh, tin lunchbox and a burrito that she made. Uh, later, I found out about Doritos and ham sandwiches, but here I am with my burrito. 
Um, and it was at this Head Start program that I got to learn uh, and, and, and really, through the privilege of education, learn English. And for that, I will always be supportive of libraries and the power that they have in our communities, especially our immigrant communities as a space that's not just safe, but can really open up the world um, for you. And now I'm here in New York doing this good work with all of you. Uh, the New York Public Library rep reports that it has increased outreach to recent immigrants and further expanded its robust language and citizenship offerings to ensure immigrants can access the free legal services it needs. they need. Today I hope to hear about how the administration and all three libraries together are making language access a cornerstone for their service delivery model for immigrant New Yorkers. Increasing literacy across the city is a noble goal. In our city, 50% of immigrant New Yorkers are considered to have limited English proficiency. Without full language access, there remains a gap in English language, let alone literacy. And I, be I believe that libraries are uniquely positioned to respond to this. So I look forward to this conversation. I wanna thank staff who helped work on this hearing, the committee counsel, Harbani Oja, committee policy analyst, Elizabeth Cronk, my staff, chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, legislative director, Cesar Vargas, and communications director, Tony Chirito, as well as the staff of the Cultural Affairs and Libraries and International Intergroup Relations. Thank you so much, looking forward to this. Thank you very much, Chairman Chaka, and um, that story of you and your lunchbox um, is impossibly adorable, and, um, uh, and you never get tired of hearing stories of uh, people and their love affair with their libraries and their first experiences with their libraries and how they came to get their libraries, and I'll just share, uh, you know, I grew up in Astoria, Queens and, and our library was the Broadway uh, branch and it was there that I got my first library card and I remember my mother taking me uh, the very spot in that library where uh, I got the card and when I got the card I felt uh, for the first time in my life that I was like a person, you know, because I could see that I had this ticket to all this information and then learned how to read uh, uh, and really appreciate books up in the children's room on the second floor at the Broadway branch in Astoria, uh, only to then go to work for the Queens uh, Public Library System for 11 years and help that library. And now I represent that branch in my district and we have renovated the, uh, virtually the entire library. But most importantly, my mother was there with me when we cut the ribbon on the reopening of the newly renovated children's room at the Broadway Library, the very same room where I um, learned how to read. So it's an incredible uh, story. Uh, all of ours and our love affairs with our public libraries and everything that you all do. Um, so I wanna uh, welcome a uh, member of the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee, uh, Council Member Francisco Moya, also of Queens. Uh, and I think we're going to hear now from our three uh, presidents and CEOs uh, in the order that they choose, uh, but I will recognize them. Tony Marks, uh, President and CEO of the New York Public Library, Linda Johnson, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, and Dennis Walcott, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library. You may begin. Good morning, I'm Tony Marks, um, and I wanna start by, of course, thanking uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, Chairs Jimmy Van Bramer and Carlos Menchaca and Councilman Moya and the entire city council for holding this hearing and for your incredible support over these years uh, of all things library and therefore all things New York. Um, this issue is obviously hugely important. Um, I, um, all right, we're gonna do stories. So I grew up in Inwood. Um, the Inwood branch was my branch. Um, and um, I'm so proud that we're about to do a complete, provide a completely new, bigger, better library in Inwood with uh, 170 affordable housing units above it. Um, and that's super exciting. Um, so New York is home to approximately 3.2 million immigrants. Actually, that's a sort of strange sentence. N new York is all immigrants. <laughs> America is almost all immigrants. And in these days in which we are provoked to hate and disrespect, we've completely forgotten 
who we are and where we come from um, and what we owe to the next generations to make possible the American dream in the way that it was made possible uh, for us. We're sitting here. The, um, and, you know, it is a sad statement that we have to remind ourselves and do more than remind ourselves. We have to yell and scream about what's going on and do everything we can to bring America back to where she should be. Um, so as the nation's largest public library system, we are of course committed to serving the immigrant population. We are committed to serving all populations um, with language, reading, learning, cultural programs across all ages, backgrounds, educational levels, and ethnicities. The libraries are the most visited civic institution in this town. They are the most used and trusted in this town. Um, and that's because we are meeting people's needs. We'll take you wherever you are, from illiterate to Nobel laureate, and help you move further. And that is a glorious statement of inclusion and opportunity and respect at the core of libraries and at the core of New York. If it's my mother, tell her I'm, no, never mind. <laughs> um, so let's see, we, uh, we have everything we do is for every New Yorker, but you know, immigrants being a hugely important part of that, um, we particularly focus and in fact have an immigrant services division um, that is uh, trying to pay particular attention to this community. This morning I'd like to focus on four priority areas, information technology and collection development, government partnerships and citizenship information, outreach and programming, and the census. And I will summarize, uh, but you have a copy of my, uh, of my testimony. Uh, in 2012, uh, we launched Tech Connect to provide um, free uh, computer skills training um, to any New Yorker who seeks it. We've grown to offer over 80 different classes in multiple languages, including Spanish, Chinese, and Bengali. And we've helped hundreds of thousands of patrons gain much needed skills in an increasingly digital world with classes available at all skill levels from how do you turn it on to how do you code. Um, we, um, we offer a host of electronic resources including test preparation materials, practice exams for immigrants interested in pursuing US citizenship to Freedom Flix, an ebook online platform and of course, we provide the broadband, the Wi-Fi, and the computers that uh, make it possible since a shocking number of Americans are on the wrong side of the digital divide or in the digital dark. Um, we are working, we, uh, we promote our world language collections. I'm happy to go into details about that amazing collection of millions of items. Um, we have curated a Latino and Puerto Rican cultural collection and gallery. We, uh, we've created the best books in Spanish for kids, a list, uh, because we are committed to getting, as we say, more people reading more. And that means the library needs to focus on New Yorkers who are not reading or not reading enough. And those are often in the poorest neighborhoods, and that is a, a primary focus. In fact, it's our number one goal this year to see if we can massively increase not just library card holders, but people who are actually using their cards to read. Turning to government partnerships and citizenship information, um, we, uh, we provide services including application assistance, test prep, study groups, citizenship classes, and legal services for immigration-related uh, programs uh, with 6,000 attendees annually to programs that offer a path to citizenship. The New American Corners, uh, with your help and support, are in every NYPL branch. Um, we, uh, we're partnering since 2015 with the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, um, and, and proud to do that, and, and great partners. Um, so thank you for that. We offer citizenship classes and informal study groups. Again, through those partnerships, we're able to provide free legal assistance to immigrants. Again, it is a sad statement um, that we should 
come to a place where that is necessary, but it is essential at this point. Um, we, uh, we, have, we work with the Immigrant Justice Corps who have uh, set up shop in the Mott Haven branch in the South Bronx, uh, the poorest congressional district in the United States. Um, we, uh, we've established in 2017, we partnered with Justice Fellows with a supervising attorney and applicants to assist, to, uh, to assist applicants with removal defense. Again, amazing that that should, shocking that that should be necessary and complex affirmative asylum applications. Since 2005, the until now known Mid-Manhattan Library, shortly to be the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library when it opens uh, in uh, March of this year. Um, we, uh, we help those who are applying for the diversity visa lottery. Um, we work, again, to help uh, New Yorkers get past the digital divide by lending uh, Wi-Fi to people at home, working with the school system to do that. Um, and we're hap delighted to see that we can help people become citizens with applicants hailing from Albania to Burkina Faso, Ecuador to Mongolia, and 27 other countries from around the world. Um, let's see, since 2012, our English as a Second Language, Adult Basic Education, and English for Work classes have significantly expanded, a seven-fold increase uh, to now 15,000 seats in the last fiscal year and 39 loca of our locations and you'll be hearing similar impressive numbers from my colleagues of Brooklyn and Queens. We uh, continue, uh, we help people uh, continue on to the ABE and, and English for Work classes with over 20,000 attendees in the last fiscal year. Um, we have a drop-in English con conversation classes for ESOL learners in 22 sites. We, um, we have, opened correction, we have opened ESOL classes in two correctional facilities on Rikers Island where also for the first time the library now has physical libraries uh, both at Rikers and at the Manhattan Detention Center. Um, with additional funding from the City Council we'll be able to continue to expand both formalized literacy and language instruction as well as the more fluid drop-in programs. We partner with the nonprofit organization New Women New Yorkers um, to help uh, target that community um, that includes resume services such as assistance at resume writing, networking, writing workshops, and public speaking at both our Mid-Manhattan and Chatham Square branches. We, um, we work, this year we have, we're, we're working with contractors to bring additional language program uh, in Urdu, Hindi, and Italian. Um, we, of course, also are focused on the refugee community. Uh, we've partnered with the Cayuga Center to connect unaccompanied immigrant children and their foster families um, with library services. We, we know that, um, that there are still folks uh, who are, I think it's fair to say, the libraries are the most trusted institution in this town, and all the, you know, all the polling suggests that. I recognize that's a, maybe a low bar in terms of some of the federal uh, um, issues uh, at play, um, but it's one that makes it possible for us to serve this community and for them to feel welcomed and respected. Um, but we know that there are still people who are hesitant to sign up for library cards because they don't want to provide any information. So we're now exploring what it would look like to provide a library card to folks who don't want to provide that, the kind of basic contact information. Uh, we will do anything um, to help people feel comfortable, respected, and trusted, and they can trust us. In terms of the census, we all know how essential this is, and uh, the partnership between the city and the library system I think is a demonstration, a, a recognition that we are in every neighborhood, we are the place that everyone feels comfortable, and it's particularly important that therefore we use that trust and those facilities to ensure a, a, an accurate count. And we're particularly focused on the hard to count neighborhoods where again, we are 
the sort of at the core of, of those neighborhoods. With funding support from the city, um, we've recruited a, uh, a manager for this project. We'll be staffing up. Um, we will uh, leverage community partnerships to ensure communities know that the library is welcoming space to complete the census and to get support. We'll provide language support through frontline staff, volunteers, and partner organizations. We'll provide census kiosks and digital support because this is the first online census, and again, millions of New Yorkers rely on us for their connectivity. And we'll be providing a range of programming opportunities for patrons to engage with the census um, in, in our branches. We'll do community town halls, network-wide census open houses, especially on April 1st, the, the, key, da the, the, the key date. Um, and we'll be uh, having scheduled drop-in census support programs. So we're super excited and we think we really can, can do this together. So thank you for that. Libraries serve, in conclusion, as community hubs for people of all ages, backgrounds, ethnicities, religious affiliations, based on a very simple premise. It is the basic premise of the Enlightenment and of democracy, which is everyone has the spark of intelligence, and everyone should be respected and encouraged to develop that spark. And we know that America provides horribly unequal opportunities of that sort. The libraries, simply put, are our stake in the ground as a city to say we have to equalize that opportunity and ensure that everyone enjoys it. That's why all patrons are welcome through our doors. It's why we've created trusted community relationships and partnerships with city agencies, with the city council, and beyond, um, and why we continue to expand those offerings. Um, we know that we have to do this to ensure the city and the country that we aspire to be. Thank you for your op this opportunity. Good morning. I'm Linda Johnson, president of Brooklyn Public Library, and I want to thank uh, Chair Van Bramer and Menchaca and members of the Library and Immigration Committees. Thank you for your leadership, and thank you, Commissioner Mustafi and Deputy Commissioner Salmon, for your visionary leadership of the Mayor's Office of Im Immigrant Affairs. And a particular shout out this morning uh, to our founder, the father of the public library movement, who immigrated to the United States in 1848 at the age of 13, Andrew Carnegie. Brooklyn Public Library has been a home away from home to Brooklyn's immigrants since its founding over a century ago. Our libraries are trusted community spaces, one of the first civic institutions newcomers visit when they arrive in the city. Given the current political climate, our role is more crucial than ever. Recently, a participant in one of our popular English conversation groups put it this way. The library is a chance to escape the news and get away from the constant worries of my everyday life. Our immigrant patient patrons come to our libraries because we strive to serve them in ways that are culturally appropriate, often in their native language, and our trusted staff and volunteers help smooth the way for their full participation in society. The library's shelves contain books in nearly 100 languages, and you can hear children's story time every week in 12 languages, including Arabic, Cantonese, French, Japanese, Spanish, and Urdu. More than 4,500 people take part in English conversation and citizenship preparation groups, and we offer free immigration legal assistance through our many partnerships. We distribute over 25,000 pocket-sized United States constitutions in English and Spanish at citizenship ceremonies across Brooklyn and on the 4th of July, a relatively new practice we plan to continue. Everyone who walks through our doors has within them the spark of a successful entrepreneur, the curiosity of a child, the thrill of getting lost in a good book, or the desire for full civic participation. 
and we are proud to help bring those dreams to, uh, of a full life to reality. Our aim is to provide access to library resources in patrons' native languages, strengthen our multicultural collections and English educational programs, and develop responsive programming while continuing to build strong community partnerships. Last spring, a student published a love letter to our McKinley Park Library in her student newspaper, Yale University. She wrote that she went to the library every weekend as a child, stating, my parents immigrated to the estates in the late 90s without any knowledge of English. No matter how much they wanted to, they could never help my siblings and me with school. The library offered me the opportunity to gain access to knowledge that would not have been available to me outside of this space. Her story is mirrored by the thousands each year who rely on our services. McKinley Park Library is a small but bustling branch that has one of the highest circulations in the Brooklyn system, primarily driven by patrons borrowing materials in multiple languages. The city has made it possible for us to do even more. Brooklyn Public Library has nearly doubled the budget for books in languages other than English. Our online catalog has approximately four million books, ebooks, audiobooks, DVDs, and other media available in nearly 100 languages. Beyond materials, we engage patrons with innovative programming in over a dozen languages geared toward their needs and interests. For nannies and caregivers, we have developed fairy tale writing workshops in English, Spanish, and Russian. Russian writers and poets are coming to our monthly literature club in Sheepshead Bay. For academics and learners, we teamed up with Prospect Park Alliance to launch University Open Air, a free pop-up university in Prospect Park taught by immigrants who were teachers and professionals in their home countries, but for a host of reasons are unable to teach in the States. An open call for academics who were trained outside of the United States brought in more than double the expected number of qualified candidates. Over three weeks, more than 500 people attended and joined classes. One university open air professor found a teaching position through connections he made during this program. Our work with immigrants is led by a dedicated team in the Outreach Services Department. Their approach is to engage directly with vulnerable populations, identify needs, and develop services to meet them. As a result, our offerings are in high demand. Last year, for example, attendance at ESOL classes increased by over 14%, and our immigrant immigration hotline received nearly 2,000 calls. In a touching response to the family separation crisis, our librarians delivered over 1,000 backpacks filled with school supplies and books in Spanish to children in New York who are here without their families. These books have been used by legal organizations to engage children during the long waiting time surrounding court proceedings. Librarians also set up story times and craft stations for children in waiting rooms on legal intake days. In 2017, fear of United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement arrests was so great, Brooklyn Public Library, like other institutions, saw students dropping out of our programs as they dreaded leaving their homes. We responded with a Know Your Rights workshop for ICE encounters, and in fiscal year 2019, we trained more than 330 participants. We assist patrons with citizenship, green card renewals, adjustment of status, renewal for deferred action for childhood arrivals, and temporary protracted status. These services are delivered through a strong partnership with the city's NY Citizenship Program and Immigrant Justice Corps. We apply this expertise strategically. When the federal decision to end temporary protected status for Haitians was enacted last year, the library responded by hosting special TPS workshops at Flatbush and Central branches with a strong Haitian community presence. Over the years, we have learned that many of our older patrons have a stronger desire for in-person support than hotlines. So we set up walk-in hours for immigration, immigrant services with no appointments necessary. 
These serve as a first step for our staff to connect with immigrant to other immigrants to other services with a library, as well as a lead-in to appointment-based resources available across the city. Our, vo our vision is a Brooklyn Public Library where everyone can access information, collections, and services in the languages they speak. In 2015, we became the first city library to offer Language Line, allowing staff and patrons to communicate in over 100 languages via telephone. This winter, we will expand language access by introducing Travis translation devices in every library in Brooklyn, providing an additional real-time interpretation tool to enhance customer service. Two years ago, Brooklyn Public Library created a volunteer language bank, a group of librarians certified and formally trained in interpretation and translation services. These librarians translate print material ranging from library card applications to program flyers, as well as providing simultaneous, simultaneously, simultaneous translation at BPL events. As Brooklyn Public Library rebuilds a historic number of libraries across the borough, we have been conducting stakeholder engagement in multiple language. For Sunset Park's new library, the library hosted design workshops in Arabic, Chinese, English, and Spanish to bring a wide swath of the community together for a design session. At New Utrecht Library, engagements were held with simultaneous Chinese interpretation. As we renovate or construct one third of our branches over the next five years, we will continue this level of engagement accessible in the language of the communities we serve. Brooklyn Public Library's 1,000 community partners are the bedrock of our ability to meet the needs of a diverse borough. One of our strongest and most long-standing partnership is with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. We support and participate in many of Moya's initiatives, including IDNYC, New American Corners, NY Citizenship, Immigrant Heritage Week, We Speak NYC, and Community Resource Fairs. At Central Library, we are building a brand new office and waiting area for IDNYC as part of our new government services wing, including a passport office, rotating partner space, and a space for civics. It will open later this winter in time for Census 2020 outreach to Brooklyn's hard to count populations. Along with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the library is also a convener of local coalitions. For example, the Sunset Park Community Roundtable, a group of organizations and neighbors dedicated to helping immigrants, meets every six weeks at the Sunset Park Library. The Roundtable has collaborated on resource fairs, community surveys, and programs offered in library space. A meaningful new partnership with Brooklyn-based nonprofit Emma's Torch repurposed the cafe at the Central Library. Emma's Torch provides culinary training to refugees, asylees, and survivors of human traffic, trafficking, positioning them to begin meaningful careers in the, in the food services industry. As part of the Pat CAFE program, students acquire barista skills and customer service experience, as well as the opportunity to attend the diverse range of free classes at the library, further supporting their educational development. I would be remiss if I did not mention our partnership with the City Council. You are one of our closest allies, from ensuring funding for our libraries and the services provided within them, to hosting events, town halls, and even immigration attorneys at the branches in your district. The Council truly understands the importance of libraries for immigrant populations in every neighborhood, and for this we cannot thank you enough. Every day, Brooklyn Public Library welcomes people to our branches who arrive in this country hungry for opportunity. We collect immigrants with knowledge of English. We connect immigrants with knowledge of English, employment opportunities, and legal assistance. Libraries provide everything from pathways to civic participation to an escape from day-to-day -day worries. With tensions rising in the aftermath of the 2016 election, Bay Ridge Library staff, who serve a significant immigrant population, captured the library sentiment perfectly on a chalkboard sign outside the branch. It read, you are welcome here, you are loved. Patrons began adding their own messages to the sign, 
filling it with notes written in the many languages spoken in the neighborhood. Everyone is welcome here has become the unofficial slogan of Brooklyn Public Library. It reminds us that we are here to ensure access to all, regardless of language, country of origin, or immigration status. A space for families to connect and a source of critical information in a changing world. We are as honored to serve immigrant communities today as we have for over one century. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dennis Walcott. I have the honor of being the president and CEO of the Queens Public Library. I want to thank the chairs, Van Bramer and Machak, and the members of this joint committee for the opportunity to testify today. I would also like to thank the commissioner uh, for her leadership and partnership with New York City's public libraries as well. So now before I give my formal testimony, I want to answer two things that were mentioned earlier uh, in the introduction by the chairs. Uh, in one, in my library experience as a child, uh, really draws to mind uh, the people who were probably the librarians, if they were alive today, saying, he's the CEO of the Queens Public Library. It's like the disconnect might be somewhat mind-boggling for them. But in addition to that, I would say to the chair, to get the uh, chair of Van Bramer's pictures, you're going to have to issue me a subpoena, because we have it under lock and key at this moment, and only released on special occasions. So the younger Van Bramer is always protected by us in that regard. So it's separate and a part of that. Uh, you are always welcome to see what pictures exist of the chair. And we also have pictures of other Queens Council members who are on the panel as well in their younger days as well. So just want you to know that, and that's why we provide information to serve your needs. Uh, that's why we were looking forward to a robust budget this year. Yes, that helps us in the process of continuing to expand our information <laughs> services to all populations. And you have my formal testimony, and I'll skim through it because it also repeats a lot of what uh, Linda and Tony have stated as well. But you know, we are the great equalizers in a democratic society. As all of you know, any individual can walk through a library door. We don't ask your background, we don't ask your race, your ethnicity, your sexual persuasion. It doesn't matter. You are always welcome to our doors. And as a result of that, we always try to become innovative and provide programs to serve that population. And as Chair Van Bremen mentioned, uh, back in 1977, uh, 42 years ago, uh, we created the New Americans program, and it was dedicated to providing comprehensive programs and services for immigrant populations. Almost half of the Queens residents are foreign-born, making this program a vital resource. And just to share a snapshot of what we all do and what we just recently did over this past weekend, uh, this past Saturday at one of our libraries, we had the opening of our Caribbean Arts Festival, uh, which was a gorgeous festival where we had over 210 people coming into our library to look at the artwork on the wall. And if you go to nine of our libraries, including Central right now, you will see Caribbean art displayed. And even before I came here today, I stopped at Central and I saw some pieces of art on the wall that was truly magnificent. I was just like, over the top, gorgeous. And I say that because it really ties into what we're talking about today, and that's to make our libraries open and welcome to all populations, but also making sure that immigrant populations feel welcome and warmly engaged. In addition to that, yesterday, through Nick Buron shared it, uh, we had at another one of our libraries a memorandum of understanding with the Korean Cultural Center. Uh, with that formal MOU, we were able to reinforce the relationship that we have uh, with them around providing material and books and services to populations in the Goldrick Library and other libraries in their area and our area. And that's exciting as well. And we work closely with our own programs. We work closely with the Adult Learner Program, the Job Business Academy, and community libraries to assess local needs and link residents with existing system-wide library and social services to enhance civic engagement. The New American Program organizes workshops in languages spoken by the Queens immigrant communities to assist new immigrants in adapting to life in the United States. 
Workshops cover a variety of topics that include, but are not limited to, job search help, entry job level training, technology training, small business development, immigration law, citizen applica citizenship application, tenant rights, career planning, parenting and health, coping skills, music and dance, drama performances, bilingual poetry readings, storytelling and crafts are among the cultural programs offered to celebrate the diversity of our communities. <laughs> our adult learner program also offers adult basic, basic education for immigrants, covering topics such as math, reading, and writing skills. It offers high school equivalency instruction for new immigrants who did not complete high school in their home country, or those who have a high school diploma but is not recognized in the United States. Case management services are also available at several of our adult learning centers, which provide social service assistance and referrals to immigrants for important matters like housing and accessing supplemental nutritional assistance programs at SNAP benefits. Queens Public Library also offers ESOL classes at many of our branches and adult learning centers, including conversational English classes, as well as contextualized ESOL classes that focus on job searching, entrepreneurship, and using new technology. ESOL conversation groups are also offered in select libraries for customers to practice English. Uh, the New Americans Initiative, Corner Initiative in partnership with the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services held and the New York City office, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs dedicates a space in every single one of our libraries where immigrants can find information and resources to become U.S. citizens. In partnership with the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, we, along with the New York Public Library and the Brooklyn Public Library, our tri -Li group, participate in the New York City Citizenship, or NYC Citizenship Program, which assists immigrant New Yorkers with free citizenship applications and financial counseling. Weekly appointments can be made with immigration attorney at our Central, Flushing, and Jackson Heights libraries. As the city transitions from New York NYC citizenship to Action NYC, we look forward to continuing the great partnership and hope to provide the same level of services uh, in those programs as well. Queens Public Library provides free citizenship classes that help customers prepare, prepare for the naturalization exam. Moreover, we collaborate with the Immigration, Immigrant Justice Corps to provide free immigration legal assistance, status adjustments, green card renewal, and other related services in English and Spanish at our Long Island City Adult Learning Center. Through another proud partnership with the de Blasio administration, TriLi implemented IDNYC, uh, New York City Signature Free Identification Card Program for all New York City residents. And since the program's inception, Queens Public Library has helped over 220,000 New Yorkers enroll to receive their ID cards with over 12,400 people uh, integrating their QPL card with their IDNYC card. Undocumented immigrants often have difficulty obtaining government issued identification. Knowing this and knowing that immigrants trust our institutions and spaces, New York City libraries were and remain ready and willing and able to serve some of our most vulnerable communities. And just as a quick aside, uh, when I look at the stats from our libraries, obviously Flushing is number one with IDNYC. It's just off the chart with Central and Jackson Heights and others following, but Flushing is just an amazing library as far as the volume of services that it provides. In addition to providing vital programs and services, we must also ensure our frontline staff are communicating effectively with our newest New Yorkers. Every library and adult learning center in our system have both the Travis devices that Linda referred to and tablets with Google Translate for our staff to connect with our customers regardless of the language they speak. These translation devices are crucial for our staff to properly assist customers in an efficient and timely fashion. QPL's collection contains materials in 30 languages. We actively purchase adult and children's books and magazines and newspapers and CD movies and more. Other in our other international language collections are throughout the system, some of the largest available in the United States. And one more quick aside, and then I'll wrap up. It's interesting, say for example, in Langston Hughes Library, where Council Moyer uh, represents. As you know, with the founding of Langston Hughes was founded predominantly based on 
African Americans who lived in that community. And as the community has changed, we've seen the library change with more materials, diverse materials representing the various populations that have moved into that neighborhood. And I think all of us have that example in our respective libraries as a neighborhood changes, the demographic changes, we're out front of that and having materials and responding to that in ways that really reflect and hopefully support and respect the individuals who are moving there. Our immigrant-focused programs and services are continuously in high demand. In fiscal year 2019, QPL welcomed over 18,200 participants to our more than 8,600 immigrant-focused program sessions. We hosted over 4,600 ESOL sessions, which had over 4,100 participants. Our ESOL participants are seeing the results. This past fiscal year, they experienced an average educational gain of 59%. In addition to our ESOL program, QPL provided citizenship counseling to over 900 individuals and completed more than 1,600 sessions. Our over 380 coping skill workshops, helping new arrived, newly arrived immigrants adjust to American society, also had over 6,200 participants. The Job Business Academy integrated English literacy and civics education sessions, which teaches contextualized English and training for technology or home health aid jobs to over 230 individuals who produced a post-test rate of 79%. Nearly 2,500 hours of immigration legal assistance to 270 individuals and over 230 cultural celebration programs attracting over 6,400 400 attendees reinforcing our commitment to inclusion and diversity within our borough. And a lot of those programs, people who are from the communities but beyond the communities attend the classes, the cultural programs, the dance sessions, you name it, and it's really the true mixture of New York City at those events. These programs and services we offer to our customers allow them to make real positive differences in their lives. For Immigrant New Yorker Ana Diaz, finding a free and high quality English language class where she could express herself in a safe and trusted environment was extremely difficult. She then discovered and registered for an intermediate EOSOL course at the Briarwood Library. With every class, she started becoming increasingly independent and self-reliant. She became so confident in her English language skills and was so grateful to the library for empowering her, she felt compelled, compelled to share her story and show off her new skills. Last year, by providing public testimony at the Library's Committee FY 2019 preliminary budget hearing. Libraries, as indicated by my colleagues, are trusted entities that people turn to when in need. Anna's story is unique to her, but it highlights the role of not just Queen's Public Library, but all of our libraries and play in lives and immigrant customers. As we strive towards building a vibrant, informed, cohesive, and empowered society, it starts with making sure that our most vulnerable populations receive the care and services they need. Thank you again, chairs, for your leadership, Thank you to the City Council, to our speaker, and to the mayor for the opportunity not just to testify, but as a result of your funding, to be there for our immigrant communities in New York City and always have our doors open. And we truly appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all three of you for your testimony. And uh, Dennis, in particular, I want to thank you for your discretion with the photos of a younger Jimmy Van Bramer. Um, I protect uh, our staff members. <laughs> I have seen those photos, and I want you to know I did not have any gray hair when I worked for the Queens Public Library. This is what a career in politics will do for you with all of this gray hair. Um, so I want to thank you all for everything you do. I also want to recognize the members of, of the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee who are here, and then Council Member and Chairman Chaka will recognize the members of his committee. I want to recognize uh, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo uh, from Brooklyn and uh, the newest member of our committee, Council Member Mark Joni from the Bronx. And I'm going to hand it over to my co chair, Carlos Menchaca. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. And I want to welcome Council Member from Queens. Uh, both of them, actually, Council Member Moya and Council Member Drum. Thank you for being here. And I, uh, we also want to thank and welcome, and we want to swear in uh, Deputy Commissioner Salmon. Um, and thank her for being here and representing the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. It's important that we have that voice here to really kind of think about how the Mayor's Office is really supporting the work that 
we're doing here um, and that we're talking about here. And so we're just thankful that you are here today and we can swear her in. Please raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you for that. And I also want to uh, welcome uh, council member Levin as well. Thank you for being here today. So uh, I want to start with some questions actually to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I want to um, ask a little bit about how the Mayor's Office utilizes library branches to get information out into the public in very specific rapid response ways. Um, so much of what we heard from the testimony is is kind of embedded in the work, the daily work of, of a library, but so much has been uh, coming down from the federal government, public charge, DACA, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the rapid response? Sure. Um, first, I'll say that um, Moya absolutely loves its partnership with the libraries, and thank you so much for all of the work that you do with us on a daily basis. Um, so as we assess situations, and excuse my voice, I'm losing it. Um, as we assess situations and we understand policy change is happening, and yes, they are happening on a regular basis, um, we see the libraries as a key community partner. And like with our other community-based organizations, um, in a very quick turnaround, we disseminate information. We assess what forums or town halls or community gatherings are happening. How do we get information to all of our stakeholders um, in a quick way? Who's covering what neighborhoods? Where do we fill in? Where can the libraries fill in? And then the other partners. Um, and so. Uh, that's how it has been working, and I think we've all been doing a pretty good job trying to assess the needs and getting the information out very quickly. Is there a sense of, uh, you have three different, three different branches here covering the entire city, um, how you target specific branches for certain factors and, 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 and information, language, et cetera? Sure, and I think I can use an example that um, Linda referenced in her testimony during the um, TPS when uh, with the Haitian community, we quickly you know, work with our, that, th those partners in that community to get the information out. Obviously, that's not the entire need, but building off that example. Got it. How has Moya served as an advisor on language access to the three libraries? So, um, Local law does not cover the libraries. Of course, if we are asked anything, it could be a partner in any way in order to help inform language access services or translation, um, we will, but I believe the libraries cover that on their own and said so in their testimony. Um, and how, what are the results of the, um, and I know you mentioned the, the local law component and, but the work that you've done already in the past for other projects. I guess what I'm saying is, or I'm trying to ask, is how, how successful are the language access conversations with the libraries? And have they kind of gleaned, have you gleaned needs that are coming from the libraries around language access through the multiple projects that you've been working on? So if we speak specifically about programs that are running in the libraries that Moya oversees, for instance, IDNYC, mm -hmm. IDNYC or Moya will handle the language access needs and translations. As far as working with the libraries on any specific needs, they have a, we have a very open relationship and anything that we can do to assist with both language access or translation, we will, but I think they are best suited to answer questions regarding their needs on translation and language access. Absolutely, and we're gonna to get to the needs okay. piece uh, from the libraries. R really, we're just trying to pin the, the kind of uh, the uh, accountability and role for the mayor's office and understanding what, what the needs are from your perspective. Mm -hmm. And how does the We Speak New York program operate within the three library branches? So, um, We Speak, last year had 269 classes total citywide and 99 of those classes were held in the library. So actually 35% of our classes are held there. The library serves as a host and a partner site for us. 
Um, the way we speak operates is that um, facilitators are volunteers. Um, they get trained through our office. We give all of the materials to the sites and to the facilitators that they need, both for the students and the facilitators to execute the curriculum. And there are um, two seasons. So the curriculum is both uh, written and video-based. And so um, the libraries have been instrumental in helping us roll this out. I want to get a sense of the numbers here. You said 296. We, uh, 269 we classes oh, 200, in FY19. And then 99 classes Of that, 99 were in the libraries. 199? 99. 99 uh, were at the libraries. Of the 269. Of the 269. And how many people were able to access that those programs? in the libraries or do you have a do you have a I, I could get back to you on that i don't on the, have on the, the number people. of people no but we were in all three systems um mm -hmm. and continue to be how was information about we speak new york shared in the libraries so there is information i i believe that both our staff our teams that are in the libraries giving outreach information as well as the libraries disseminate that it is on the host sites to also do community outreach and so again i will uh, let the libraries speak to their uh, particular outreach efforts yeah and i think maybe at this point i'll ask the the um uh the libraries at this point to talk a little bit about the we speak program and what and how the uh, 99 classes throughout the system were were accessible through um, your library systems. And you can, eat, whoever wants to start, don't all jump up at the same time. We look to our right and get more detailed information. <laughs> and as it comes up to us. While they're waiting, I can tout we speak a little bit. We just received an Emmy. That's right, congratulations. Yes, thank you. Was, and yes. it was on instructional and instrumental production and we are um, super excited about it. So was our teams and it was on one of our episodes which you can access online called Rolando's Rights. So. And it was for that one particular episode? For that episode, okay. yeah. Okay, Rolando. Rolando's rights. Rights, okay. Thank you for that. Are there, are there, is there data, just as we wait for them, um, data on like downloads and that kind of uh, uh, user data? So we just um, last year, probably maybe a year and a half ago, moved to digital, uh, really expanding our digital platform. Mm -hmm. um, and we were ready to execute on that and making the website more interactive so that people could actually take quizzes after each episode. That rolled out last spring. So this for people who cannot go to a site um, or want to access materials at home. Um, since we have updated uh, the website to allow for that, we've had about 164,000 visitors, which is amazing. And we've actually, and I don't have the data on me, but we've actually had people globally access the website, which is awesome. <laughs> We're teaching the world how to speak New York. <laughs> Okay, please, with, with my uh, accent. Linda. So in Brooklyn, we offer We Speak uh, New York classes, conversation groups uh, across the entire borough, most recently um, in Brighton Beach and Sunset Park, coincidentally. Um, and the classes are promoted through other programs that we offer and also through our online calendar. And, and Linda, can you talk a little bit about the ways that it is advertised within the libraries. We, we kind of want to get a sense about the, the, the kind of experience of someone. How does it get, exp get experience? Is there like a, uh, well, you tell us exactly well, how. Uh, for one thing, uh, patrons who are participating in other programs will learn about the We Speak um, uh, NYC classes there and um, all of our calendars, um, in particular the online calendar, um, makes note of the time of those classes and um, and the location. And what languages are people learning about We Speak New York? How are they being invited? Uh, 
Um, Apparently, they're offered um, to all of the languages that we're doing English conversation classes in. So, um, uh, I don't know. I don't have a more specific answer than that. Sorry. If the other libraries do that, I'd like to hear that as well. Thank you. Yep. We'll, we'll get that to you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, so we we uh, focus our the we speak NYC efforts. Uh, previously, we are New York. Um, with the videos and the programs associated with it in our drop-in English con conversation classes, which I mentioned. So in FY19, we had almost 24,000 participants in uh, six, a little over 1,600 sessions in 22 locations, or 22 of our branches. I think it may be 23 at the moment. Um, in FY18, we served uh, uh, 19, over 19,000. Um, and in FY17, we were at 20,000. And uh, again, we're so grateful for all the assistance from Moya and, and on this front. And I wanted to ask a little bit about how, um, how it's being advertised and what languages are people being invited into the space. I, I understand and the way that the curriculum is built within the We Speak is in English, so you're, you're learning it in English and this is any kind of English conversational. Uh, what we're looking for is a sense of how how someone has been invited, and is it is it in what what language is the invitation coming in? Well, in our case, because we focus on sort of intermediate language uh, uh, capacity, um, we do advertise it in English because the English is what the conversations are happening in. But across the system, you know, we have uh, trained our staff, and we're using technology to ensure that we can help uh, people who need help, you know, in any language potentially. Though, that means. There are a lot of languages. We have in our collection 222 different languages uh, associated. But of course, we focus on the major ones. So with Queens, we'll be glad to get back to you with specific numbers, because I don't have the numbers here, and I don't want to give you wrong information. But with any type of advertising, we use our various platforms to advertise our programs. So that includes you know, our marketing department and having information go out on the website, as well as the flyers uh, that we put up. And then we've started something new. Uh, in our uh, central library where we have a board, basically a computer board that gives all the information around the various classes and programs we offer and we do that in different languages. And then we, I guess around nine months ago, developed a new website and the new website is uh, language friendly and really has a lot of accessible information in a variety of languages, but I can't give you more details without giving you wrong details and I don't want to do that. Thank you for that, and let's. We, we'd like to follow up on 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 that. I think sure. the uh, the numbers are 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 um, kind of indicative of of the role partnership that you have together with the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. Uh, a lot of money has has been invested in this program, and so I think what we're trying to figure out is how we how we understand it and make sure that we can create more robust access to, to the service. Well, if I may, a key point to that, though, yes. is that with these sessions as well as other sessions with Moya, they provide a valuable service to us as far as translation services as mm -hmm. well of material. And so we work in close partnership with their staff and our staff to make sure whatever the class may be in whatever particular area, there is that integration of services between Moya and for us, and I imagine my colleagues, the uh, library system. Well, and we heard earlier that, that you all, um, while you're not part of the local, lang local law uh, pertaining to language access, you all take care of your own language access needs. And so what are those needs, and do you see them change over time, and very specifically around some of the rapid response stuff that we've been, uh, as a city, trying to do and get information out? What are the language access needs? Are they increasing in any way? And how can, um, uh, Moya's here right now, how can, we, how can we ensure that they understand what those needs might be across the board? So I'll jump in, in that with the changing needs and the changing demographics, I mean, our librarians are always trained in professional development around what's going on in their respective communities, and we put a lot of power in our managers to be reflective of knowing what's happening in their areas of uh, service, and so the materials reflect that, classes reflect that, and adjustments are made accordingly based on what they see locally. And then from Central, uh, today is Tuesday, uh, we have every Tuesday 
PD uh, set aside from 9 until 12-ish or so, where we go into a number of areas to make sure that our staff are participating and getting new information and material around what's happening, whether it's language access to new immigrant populations, different type of training, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion training, and what that means for our society and our customer base as well. So we try to incorporate that on a regular basis on Tuesdays in our professional development in addition to our normal class sharing that takes place. Um, we're very appreciative of the services that we've been offered. I don't think it's an issue of needing more. I think the question is, uh, as we've all discussed earlier today, how populations um, are shifting in the borough and uh, how language needs change in various branches depending on how those populations are moving. And, and just to stay there uh, really quick in Brooklyn, Linda, and talk a little bit about how, how, you're, how you're anticipating those changes and how quickly are you able to meet those, those shifts and change in, in language access needs. Well, of course, uh, a lot of that happens because of the individual relationships that our librarians have uh, with our patrons, um, also because our collections float. Often we end up seeing um, langu foreign language materials that we thought belonged over in one mm -hmm. branch starting to pool in a different branch, which is an early indicator um, of what's going on in terms of language needs in different branches. Mr. Chairman, the, um, so um, you know all this, but uh, in the Bronx, obviously, uh, focus on Spanish, but as well as various African languages, Bengali, French, Albanian, and Italian. In Manhattan, it's again Spanish, and then Chinese, French, Korean, Russian, Japanese, German, Hebrew, and Italian. Staten Island, Spanish, Russian, Italian, Chinese, and Arabic. We, um, again, as, as Linda said, as neighborhoods shift, the, the constituency in the branches shift, the collections move partly naturally through floating, but also as directed when we see increased demand. So, for instance, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in is now primarily Dominican, so massive collections in Spanish, which I suspect were not as massive when I was a kid uh, growing up in the neighborhood. Um, and we, not only do we move collections, but we also try to move or target staff who have language skills, you know, that are appropriate for each neighborhood. That may mean training, sometimes with computer assistance for tra translation, especially if someone doesn't have those language skills. But we're always looking for, you know, our amazing, talented librarians to be based in places where, if they have those language skills, we can we can put them to play. Currently in Queens. Uh, we're conducting a community needs assessment and asset mapping with Expand Ed, and that includes uh, analyzing demographic data as well as program data in order to identify gaps in services and programs, and that includes languages as well. And so we've been very assertive in that regard in working and developing the community mapping initiative. Thank you for sharing that. The, the asset mapping would be really interesting to, to utilize. Um, the asset mapping sounds really interesting. And I'm assuming, I don't know if that's happening across the board, but um, the shifts are happening so fast. And I guess we want to make sure that, that we're all concentrated on language access, which is why we took, I took a little bit of extra time with We Speak New York as just one program and thinking about how people are accessing that program and really thinking about how someone who might read in Spanish might not be ready to read in English, but could speak in English, has an access point that is in their language, not necessarily English. So this is why we want to be uh, thoughtful about how, how we increase access as it continues to grow. And, and uh, bef I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to Chair Van Bramer, even though I have a, a census question too, but Please, go ahead. I can keep going. Thank you. Um, the New American Corners is uh, an important program. And I guess uh, if I can ask Moya this question, how, how are we working together with the libraries to ensure that we rem this program and the, the library itself can remain safe for spaces, uh, for a space for immigrants to seek out library and community services? <clears throat> This is about a safe space. How do we, how do we, how are we maintaining the libraries as a safe space for immigrants to enter and access services? I mean, I would say that um, 
the, the libraries are a trusted partner. We promote them as a trusted partner. That's why we host so many of our programs at the libraries. Um, the libraries do an unbelievable job in making sure that people are respected, that the spaces that we do create are private um, and or have some sense of privacy. I can speak to the IDMYC space as an example of that, making really sure, uh, we made sure as we went from library to library, even our pop-up models, that there, that even in a very busy lobby like Flushing, um, there's still, still a sense of privacy created, there's still waiting and maintaining areas, and I think that we did um, a lot of the setup with the libraries in the very beginning, making sure that these corners were in every single branch, and um, the libraries have done an unbelievable job maintaining that space as safe for um, all people to access. Did, did you guys want to say anything further? Well, before that? I get to libraries, I, I just want to go back to Moya. The, um, I guess, is there is there a like a sense of protocol or a, a kind of established sense of 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 uh, things that you just do? I think the IDMYC is a great example of this model. Um, I, I'm asking about the New American Corners. Does that same does the same, does the same protocol um, advice consulting happen across the way for for just safe to maintain a safe space? We are in constant communication with the libraries on everything that we are doing with them. So yes, of course, we are always looking to see how we can maintain and improve any programming happening. And so the libraries, how has Moya helped instruct you in, in maintaining the sense of safety? We all know that libraries are very, very trusted partners. We want to maintain that, and that's that's through intentional work, and lots happened in the last few years. How's Moya uh, kind of consulted with you on that work? Oh, I mean, we're very appreciative of, of Moya's um, uh, initiative and support in this area. We're in every branch um, with the New American Corner, and um, and really, it's incumbent on the library to talk to Moya about replenishing those collections, which we which we do annually. I, I just to add, I think, again, it's a partnership. And so we listen to them, they listen to us, and as part of that partnership, you know, if things need to be improved or refined, then we're always there. So Moya has been four square with us as far as making sure that support is given to us. And around the issue of safety, and I think just walking through our door, um, provides that safe environment just to start out with. I think the people coming to the library view us that way, and I think Moya helps us reinforce that as well. To totally agree. Um, I, I want to add. I, I want to add one other thought. I mean, I think in this at this moment in history and in New York and elsewhere, uh, organizations that are focused on the immigrant experience are essential um, and doing amazing work under difficult circumstances, and we're proud to partner with them. I do think it's worth at least noting that because the library serves everyone, meaning we're not only, I don't mean that pejoratively, only focused on immigrants, we're focused on everyone, right, of which the immigrants are a huge portion, I actually think that helps to provide the sense of trust. Mm -hmm. There's a sense that I think there are people who come to the library for services who might not be as comfortable walking into an immigrant-specific mm -hmm. location because it's identifying. Um, so we can have programs for people who are not legally citizens or not, you know, uh, and you aren't self-identifying by walking in the library door. And I do think that's part of the power of the library, right? That we can target programs and welcome everyone, but we're not sort of you're not self-identifying in a way that may be scary to you under these current circumstances by taking advantage and walking in. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And again, we want to we want to stay close on that as we as we keep increasing the relationship with the libraries as a place for implementing a lot of the programs that we are talking about here. Um, including the census. So m many of you mentioned, all of you actually, I think mentioned the census work. The $1.4 million that we allocated earlier this year were, were uh, really to target that need. Is there anything more that you can tell us on exactly that process that you may have already developed for, uh, for library um, 
users to fill out the census. Anything that's specific in design that you can share with us now and give us a glimpse of? So for instance, this notion of kiosks, so we'll have uh, we'll have staff dedicated to helping people with the census, and they will have technology with them that will be dedicated to that, that also ensures privacy so that, you know, we get rid of the fear factor. Thank God we've gotten rid of the horrible citizenship question, which was designed to keep people from <laughs> filling out the census, which is mind-boggling. Um, so that, and in addition to the $1.4 million of city funds, thank you, um, and working closely with the Mayor's Office of Census Outreach, as well as ABNY and other partners. Uh, the New York Public Library itself is, is uh, putting about uh, over $600,000 of our own funds and private funds towards this effort. So um, actually, appropriately, I think we're having a teach-in tomorrow uh, on the census uh, at our central library, but um, we have uh, created a whole team of people that are focused uh, on this issue alone for the next year, and uh, a little less than a year now, I guess. Uh -huh. um, and it involves not only what's happening in each of our branches with technology and people who are trained to assist, um, and, and assistance comes in different levels depending on the sophistication uh, of the particular patron, whether they need tech assistance or are or, or, um, or already sort of comfortable uh, filling out forms online. Uh, but also we're very focused on outreach and are partnering with other organizations throughout Brooklyn so that any time we know there will be a gra gathering of uh, people, whether it's in our neighbors at the Brooklyn Museum or the garden or the park, um, we'll, we will be sending outreach librarians with dedicated tablets to those events to make sure that we can also get people to sign up even if they're not coming into the branch. So at Queens, we just hired our new civic engagement manager who will start in two weeks, and that individual will begin working with our community outreach and program and services department to create a cohesive, comprehensive outreach strategy. We'll be hiring, or have started to hire, 10 new outreach staffers who will focus exclusively on census-related outreach efforts, especially in the 40 identified hard-to-serve areas. Uh, in addition to that, we are in the process of identifying uh, those specific, very detailed challenge areas and making sure that we have uh, services available through our libraries in those areas in terms of uh, connectivity and making sure computer access is available. We'll have, as we indicated before, translation devices at all of our libraries to make sure we're able to do that. Uh, participating with other community-based organizations and making sure information is shared through Trilai. We've been working very closely together as far as our coordination around census along with the city and along with all the various partners at the city to address that. Uh, participating in a forum on Thursday, matter of fact, talking to a number of organizations around the Census 2020 and what it means. And the other layer that we're doing, and I imagine my colleagues as well, you know, we all have our friends groups as well. And so we've identified our friends groups as ambassadors for Census 2020, and they'll be doing outreach, and they know their particular areas and how we'll dispatch them to bring in more people to make sure they're participating one way or another, and also through our professional development with our libraries and our managers, making sure they have all the up-to-date information. And, and to kind of put the fine point on language access, how, how are people being invited uh, to, to these spaces that are uh, census related and that they all have a very micro-targeted way to get whatever communities around that library uh, and that those languages spoken by, by people to come into that teach-in or that uh, kiosk. And so that's, that's something we wanna be monitoring as well with you and, um, and uh, just cognizant of. My last question on census, and I'm gonna hand it over to the chair, is about security. I think one of you mentioned about securing data and information and how you're able to um, uh, describe the steps that you're taking to ensure that everyone's information is gonna be uh, secure. And I, I'm assuming that's a, that's a real issue for, for all of you. And so talk a little bit about what, how, how important that is uh, for people and the users of libraries. To, to have that conversation, how important has it been in your history as you've kind of moved into te technology? And, and what will you be doing to describe that cybersecurity priority to individuals uh, doing the census online and really anything, actually? 
And then uh, what manual, have you put any kind of manual together for all the library librarians across the system? Is it, does that exist as well uh, as, like a, as a way to go back to that uh, for reference? Um, I'll jump in here. Uh, this seems to be the topic of the month. Um, and I want to underscore that our um, that, that security and um, privacy um, is something that we've taken seriously for a long time. Um, and that while some of the tablets and the new devices that we're buying, particularly to um, increase capacity during the census period, um, will be dedicated to that particular function that all of our computers, in fact, are secure and that all of the data, whether it's data that's being submitted in the census form or whether it's other work that patrons are doing on our computers um, is secure and that it's a high priority for the library. Um, I think that the challenge here in um, making decisions around whether computers should be dedicated specifically for the census because of the sensitivity of that information in some ways undercuts the work that uh, we've been doing on this issue throughout the borough throughout time. And um, in fact, it's always been forefront and center at Brooklyn. And how are you communicating that this to people? How, how, are, yeah. how are you explaining that? <laughs> this is something that we're just, I said, this seems to be the issue du jour. Um, this is something that we're working on um, as we're speaking now because it has um, it has become a, a significant issue in the last few weeks. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I, what she said. The, uh, <laughs> um, look, the simple fact is um, we may be the last major institution left that strenuously believes in and protects privacy. Um, it is a core mission for us. The most obvious way to describe that is arguably our most valuable asset thing that we have that we could monetize is we know what everyone's reading. And we destroy that information as soon as the book comes back. We don't want to have that. We don't want to have it even if somebody comes looking for it. Similarly, um, we, while we increasingly try to measure and have metrics and assess our programs and audience, et cetera, we never cross the line to saying you have to identify yourself if you walk in the door or you walk into our program. I mean, so the library is really um, committed to this, and of course, we recognize it's our obligation to double down when it comes to the census because of the sensitivity around those issues. And we'll be training our staff, um, as well as our dedicated census staff, on, on how to address those issues, and we'll be looking at how to publicize that and reassure people. And just to add one other point, in that I think with all of us, we invest a significant amount of money in our IT departments for the whole area of security and not just around census. And it really is just part of our bread and butter and our basic existence as far as protecting information. And you can't say anything is 100% guaranteed. Um, but at the same time, we put a lot of emphasis in that and really do cross partnerships with the TriLi experts as well as people outside of our TriLi network uh, to make sure that we are front and center around security. Um, not to beat this issue to death, but I do want to add that it, it goes to the trust that we've all been talking about this uh -huh. morning, um, and uh, it's really what we um, pride ourselves on, that our patrons can come and trust us. Um, and if we weren't focused on this issue, um, we'd always be in danger of losing that trust. Um, and I would also add that um, um, as we learn how to communicate um, with our patrons in whatever language they're most comfortable, all the while assisting them um, with their English, English language skills, um, the census is being woven into all of our communications um, as the form becomes due. Thank you for that. And, and, and I think that there's no doubt that you're all focused on, on the cyber security that have, you have been focused and now the census is putting it even more at the front and center uh, uh, as, a, as a topic. And the, and the, but the, but the, the kind of harder part is how we communicate that to communities that may not have technology um, savvy understandings about about security and the different protocols and 
and but that message has to be communicated. So let's just keep connected on that. I'd like to kind of hear more and work with the chair um, to to help spread the message when that message has been crafted and how we can ensure that, that people trust and continue to trust the institutions uh, for census. Thank you. Oh, Matthew Eugene was here as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, thank you. First of all, listening to uh, uh, Chair Menchaca's questions and all of your answers uh, makes me appreciate the staff of all of your systems ever so much because all of those services and all of those questions and all of that care and concern uh, for immigrant communities and indeed everyone that you serve, uh, it's the staff at the front line, it's the staff that they see at the circulation desk, it's the staff that uh, are at the adult learning centers and uh, so I just want to uh, mention that because as I was listening to all of that, I was thinking about all of those frontline staff mm -hmm. members who, uh, who people trust uh, and who come to actually love, right? There is a deep bond between the staff of the library and the communities that they serve and uh, I witnessed it first half. Uh, and speaking of staff, I have never seen the external affairs, government affairs uh, folks more running up and down here. <laughs> it's like a run on those little yellow pieces of paper. I just I probably ran out of them somewhere at Central. That and and they're secure now and destroyed as well. <laughs> they both are secure. Uh, that was my job for 11 years. I never made that many runs up to the dais. Um, but uh, um, uh, uh, I do want to ask a few, a few questions, obviously. Um, uh, everyone knows how much I care and love uh, uh, about libraries. But uh, Tony, you mentioned uh, the issue and the thing that you're looking into discussing um, around the uh, issuing of library cards um, without identifying information, the normal information that libraries have always sort of requested. Uh, when someone applies for a library card. Uh, how soon are we, how close are we to maybe achieving that goal uh, and uh, making sure that no one is failing to seek a library card for fear that they might have to give information? Because it's sort of a, a number that you may never know, right, how many people don't even do it because they've seen their friend fill out the application and they don't want to go there. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, this came out of, uh, I think, one of the reasons that it emerged for us is uh, last year our sort of one, our sort of number one system goal was to significantly increase the number of library card holders, which this year has moved to having achieved that, I think, 23 percent increase in one year, which was significant from a large base. Um, this year it's getting people to use the cards to read more, right? And, and, and not just being passive on that front, but being proactive about it in, in more ingenious ways. But as we were focusing on the library cards, I think our, our frontline staff, who are fantastic, they are the ones who came back to us and said, there are people who are resisting this because they're scared. Um, and that generated the conversation where we said, you know, could we have a library card that um, doesn't require the identifying information, it will probably have less borrowing privileges associated with it, um, but, it but you'll still be able to borrow books and do anything else that, that the card uh, makes possible. And we, our plan is to pilot it, um, in, and we are piloting it in, <laughs> thank you, George, <laughs> in Parkchester and at 125th Street right now. And we'll assess that, and my guess is we'll go system-wide after that. Uh, George is gaining his steps for the day, by the way, at this hearing. <laughs> He's not going to the gym tonight. And uh, what does is, what is piloting uh, look like exactly? So you said it, uh, the, the, this particular version of the card may have uh, fewer borrowing privileges associated with it. Uh, Le less books at a time. Less total number of books at a time, but as long as you're returning them, you, you keep going, okay. right? Okay. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of this is about relying on our frontline staff to say, 
oh, you don't have a card, would you like one, which we've gotten much more used to, oh, you're concerned about it, let, let, here's another option, or even before concern is raised, this is another option if you would like it, right? And doing that in person as well as on the web and, and you know, signage, all those things. So if the pilot is successful, then we uh, take it further. And We're, we are in the knowledge sharing business. That's what we do. So of course we want to maximize that and we want to get rid of any constraints on it. Great, so now of course I have to ask the other two systems if they are <laughs> yeah. equally interested in taking a look at your pilot. So a couple of things, one, I'm always listening and learning and so we always take information back in all seriousness because I think it's great in different type of initiatives and programs. We do do this for temporary housing. Uh, so for the individuals who may not have a permanent ID or residence or anything along that line, we issue those types of cards, and I think of one person I always cite, I haven't seen him in a while, matter of fact, but uh, Waldo is his name, and Waldo uh, was living in a variety of different locations, and he would come to the library at Central and read at least nine books a week, and just sit and read and read and read, and we engaged in our conversation and started talking, and then Waldo said, I don't have a library card, and he said, I didn't think get one. I said, yes, you can. So we do that for temporary housing, and so we're very proud of that. And we do notice, though, especially in corona, where a number of people will not get the cards out of fear as well of having information identified. So you know, we're going to explore it, and I'm, I was listening to what Tony was talking about, and it is fascinating, and I'm not opposed to it. Would seem like a particularly uh, good thing to do in Queens yeah. uh, in so many ways. Yeah. Obviously, every one of the five boroughs, but uh, uh, as you mentioned, I think in your testimony, half of our, at least half of our population is uh, foreign born. Mm -hmm. I eagerly await the results of Tony's pilot. <laughs> good. Uh, as do we. Uh, sounds like something uh, that was really important. Uh, now, Dennis. I was there at the launch of uh, your new tagline. Uh, Linda referenced the unofficial We tagline speak your language. of the Brooklyn Public Library, but Queens has a new permanent tagline, We Speak Your Language. And um, uh, I wanted to ask, number one, uh, I guess this is all for all three systems, uh, the staff speak so many languages in and of themselves. Uh, do you have a sense of what those numbers actually are and what, what languages the staff uh, speak because that's such an incredible resource that, uh, and I know how diverse the staff mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. at all of our, our library systems. Uh, you may not have it. I see the staff going. There. George no, is going to jump. I was going to say we wouldn't even expect the staff to come up to us with that information at right. all. Yeah, but, it, but it, we will get you that information. Yeah, it it's a great question. Interesting to know. I just don't even know if you've, if you've done it. It's a great question. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know, if if the staff at the Queens Public Library speak 52 different languages, that would be amazing, and and I think something to. Uh, uh, to promote and brag about, right? Because mm -hmm. you literally speak um, uh, uh, so many different languages. And uh, uh, so no need to uh, work over the yellow pieces of paper on that one, but um, we can get that later. In terms of though we speak your language uh, and the website, right? Mm -hmm. Which is in so many different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, um, how is that going? How is that being received? And um, and, and if the other two systems want to chime in on, on what they do in terms of, well, not having the same slogan, but, but doing the same or similar work. So from the feedback I've received, the website has done extremely well. I mean, both from the platform purpose of being easier to access information, the time in turning it around as well. I think the vibrancy of the color palettes that are being used, and I think all the goals that we wanted to achieve with the website, obviously working out any bug that we hear about or feedback that we hear about, um, we're doing that in real time. So uh, it's been really good. And I think people have gained a better understanding of we speak your language, because it's not just the literal language, but it's the figurative language as well of individuals and making sure people have a clearer understanding of that. Uh, today's Tuesday, as I said, yesterday we started it. It's our time for kind. Uh, project and so it's time for kind has been launched through our website as well as well as through the program initiatives uh, yesterday we had uh, several programs at central we're branching out to 
the other branches uh, to make sure we have acts of kindness. And then what we started either last year or two years ago was post-its uh, throughout all the branches of people posting acts of kindness in school, including school children and reinforcing that That's and right. then we capture that on our website as well. So we're doing all these things and integrating it through uh, the uh, We Speak Your Language and making sure that people have a clear understanding of what's going on. I think it's going well. And is it uh, powered by Google Translate? Go is go uh, now you're getting into definitely above my pay grade okay. as far as terms technology of the IT, is concerned. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, we use Google Translate right. at the libraries. How our system is powered, I got to always start okay. to people. Give me better understanding. Stad, that we, um, in addition to the you know, language skills of our, of our staff, at the front line in the branches, ever, uh, staff are all trained to, use, to have devices and to use uh, Google Translate when there's a challenge in terms of communicating with folks. So we're, we're totally into that. And Travis as well. I don't, oops, sorry. I don't have much to add to that, only that, um, that um, we've all had the benefit of um, hiring from within our communities and therefore hiring people who are multilingual uh, in a borough where over half the households are speaking a language other than English at home. Um, and it's important today. It'll be important in the future. It's always been sort of our bread and butter. Um, and uh, the only thing that's really changing is the way technology is helping us reach um, different languages and, and more and more people who are um, learning English as a second language. And if I may, Chair, to just to give a shameful plug to the City Council, as a result of the City Council allocation, uh, it has allowed us to hire more folks as well, and folks from various backgrounds. And that type of fl funding, especially with the unrestricted nature of the funding, has the Board of Queens, I imagine my colleagues, given us the ability, we have postings all over the place, and then having uh, the two universities, library universities, Queens College, St. John's there, it gives us that richness and diversity and the word of mouth, and so maybe gaps that we had existing before we're filling now as a result of the city council funding and the importance of that funding in the future. Right, let me just assure you there is no such thing as a shameful plug for the New York City Council. Um, he, yeah. He, he yeah. meant a well-deserved plug. Yeah, we will take it wherever we can get it. Um, so. Look, I, we were talking yesterday, we had a big briefing on this hearing, and, uh, and when I worked at the Queens Public Library, I bragged about this, and I've bragged about it uh, uh, ever since. Uh, Lacey Chan, uh, I don't know if she's actually still with the Queens Public Library, but when I worked there was uh, the demographer uh, of the Queens Public Library, and uh, and I just loved the, the work that she did and the research she, that she did, right? And that was really geared at, at making sure that we anticipated uh, even the population shifts that would take place in various neighborhoods and that the collection development strategies were geared towards uh, emerging populations even. And uh, in some ways I think it was groundbreaking work and it, mm -hmm. was, it was so exciting to see that the library cared that much to make sure that we were purchasing uh, children's materials um, in languages and from, and from countries uh, that we knew uh, uh, young mothers might be taking their children uh, to Sunnyside or Corona mm -hmm. or uh, Glen Oaks. Uh, do we still do that kind of work? Is, is that uh, part of how we make sure that the, the actual collections themselves are also uh, uh, meeting the needs of immigrant communities and also speaking uh, those languages. So with Queens, we no longer have a demographer on staff, but we do a lot of that frontline work through our managers and also assessing it through the various departments at Central. And as I mentioned before, uh, we're doing this project with Expand Ed which is really taking a look at the demographic data and mapping it with the goal of then going after funding, because I would love to have somebody who is specific to that research analysis and demography of communities and how it reflects even better programming, because then that lays the foundation for going after more grants that were a part of city funding uh, to provide the funding for those gaps. So that's what we're in the process of doing now. 
Um, so, you know, we actually have heard a horrible rumor that Joe Salvo, the city demographer, is retiring. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that true? Um, heartbreaking. The guy is yeah. really a, a oh. just treasure and um, has more to contribute, in, uh, certainly to our systems, but probably to every agency that he touches. Um, but in terms of, um, of language and um, of, of, of being uh, particularly sensitive to the needs of our patrons, I think uh, in terms of children in particular, we've focused in the last year on making sure that our story time is being um, hosted in now 12 languages every week. So there's always a place for parents to bring young children regardless of the, their primary language. So just to sort of make a full circle here, we, we rely, our primary reliance in terms of this data is from the census. So we also have an interest, not just financial, not just citizen, but, but in terms of our own analytics uh, so that we can track it. But then we, you know, the frontline staff are tracking it. The, we, we track in terms of where the collections are floating in terms of languages, trying to anticipate that. And we do have an analytics team uh, that is in the president's office at the, for the system to do that as well. Yeah, so uh, uh, Dennis, in, in, in your case, even if you don't have the, uh, the title demographer, um, uh, although it's good to hear or see Nick smile and Lacey Chan is uh, still, there. Uh, still with, the, with the library, um, but we still are doing that work uh, and, and making sure that we are um, meeting the needs of, of the communities yes. in, in every way possible. Um, and. Uh, and I think it is, uh, not everyone knows how incredibly interesting I think the collection development teams are at library systems and that they are literally purchasing materials from all over the world, um, going to other uh, countries, going to book fairs and other things in other countries, making sure that they're selecting titles and, uh, and, and, and books and then making sure that they're coming back to Queens and Staten Island and, and Brooklyn, it's, it's an incredible thing uh, when you think about how much work goes in to making sure that, that all of the right um, uh, information in all the right ways is coming back home here, which is just amazing. That's why the chief librarian and the team <laughs> plays such an important role, because I think when you look under the hood and find out how a library actually works, uh, it would boggle the folks mind as far as all the intricacies and details that you just referred to, Chair, uh, that go into the selection of books, the materials, programs, and how one has to make adjustments based on the changing demographics of neighborhoods and what that means for the system overall. So you are correct, sir. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I could talk about how much I love libraries um, for days, um, but uh, it's fun to, uh, to talk about it with folks who maybe are a little bit less uh, intimately associated with, with our public libraries. Um, the, oh, I know what I wanted to ask. So some of you mentioned in your testimony, some did not, uh, the exact numbers of folks who are in the ESOL uh, classes getting uh, and receiving those services, learning how to uh, read, uh, write, and speak English uh, for free, which is such an incredibly important service that libraries provide. Um, but I also know there's like a ton of interest and not everyone gets in and sometimes there are waiting lists um, and, and that uh, you could provide even more of those services if you had the space and the resources. And uh, so uh, are you, is everyone getting in? Um, is there more interest than there are slots? And um, is it a matter of resources or space? Obviously, you're, you're doing some of these services in the meeting rooms, at, yeah. the, at the library, some of them are very small, but um, some of you gave in your testimony uh, how many folks are, are in the program, but uh, um, I guess I'm interested to know if we are meeting the need, if we are um, uh, turning anyone away, and not the library is turning anyone away uh, in a way that you would desire, but, but you just simply can't. Uh, accommodate everyone who's looking for ESOL services for free at the public libraries? So uh, as I, I think I mentioned in my testimony, or at least it's in my testimony even if I didn't mention it, s since 2012 we've increased our English language, you know, uh, offerings, the spots in them, 700 percent. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there's, re you know, we're really working at this. I, I do not hear about people turned away from English language classes. I think the only uh, major program that I'm aware of where we do turn have a waiting list is for coding classes, which is a 12-week, very intensive, you know, sort of full-on program. Um, but my guess is, offering more, we'd find more takers. Um, another example of our commitment to this is as we approach the opening of the, new, the previous, the library previously known as the Mid-Manhattan, um, we will have an entire floor focused on education programs, particularly adult education programs, and that means English language as well as computer skills, and the reason we're doing that at 40th and 5th is because the neighborhood is filled with folks who are working in offices, in hotels, in restaurants, who look to the library as a way to gain skills to move up. Um, sure. and, not, and not only will we have a whole floor for that, but it will be connected to a whole floor to help people find jobs and just create jobs. Off. You're just showing off, I tell you. Uh, hey, you do what you gotta do. Showing <laughs> off. In Brooklyn, we have two different um, types of uh, language classes. We have specific classes where the sign up and, and repetitive, you know, weekly um, or more frequent meetings, but then also we have drop-in classes, many of which are um, staffed with volunteers, and um, was, we use those as a way to try and um, make up for the uh, fact that we have limited spaces in, in, the, in the more formal class. So at Queens, we are turning people away, and it's mainly through the central operation because of space constraints as well as funding constraints at times as well, because demand, as you can imagine, in that area, especially also in Flushing as well in Jackson Heights, you know, we just get an influx of individuals, and so Queens, we're in little nooks and crannies of the Central Library at all different hours. In the evening, we're offering programs on the second floor, even at Central, which is mainly the offices. Uh, so we'll set aside some of our meeting rooms up there, and then during the day, we'll use rooms in the teen section where the teenagers are supposed to be in school. And so as a result of that, we are really tight in a number of our libraries because the demand and the populations are just changing. And I think the beauty of it is, is that the success of the program generates additional interest on the people. So the word of mouth spreads not just through the formal network, but through the underground network as far as you can get this type of service. And as you well know, when people sometimes, especially in Queens with the two airports being there, come off the plane, uh, they go to a library. I mean, that's the place they know and that's the place they trust. And so the demand really is high. So we can meet that demand with additional funding, but also we have to take a look at our internal space allocations and how we do it and also balance the other needs of the library as far as space allocation is concerned. Okay, can I just add, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, so thinking about the Bronx Library Center, which is our second, uh, right now our largest branch, it, it's typically our second largest branch. You know, we have a whole floor uh, for English language instruction um, it looks like the UN, I mean, or what the UN should look like. <laughs> the, um, and, and really dramatic, I, I'll never forget going, showing a donor um, this space to get some more support. And we're sitting there and, and a woman, a uh, covered woman, uh, suddenly stands up and walks towards me and then gets on her knees. And I'm like, what is going on? And I realized it was prayer time and I was standing on the eastern side of the of the room, I mean, it's just incredible what goes on. And, you know, as we all have increased our education programs, we find parents coming in for English language while their kids are doing homework help or after school programs. This has changed how we build libraries and we're all, again, with thanks mm -hmm. to the support of the city council and being in the 10-year capital plan finally after, I don't know, a century, um, that, you know, that we, we still need the open floor plans for the library space, but increasingly we're, re we're recapturing or adding space with program appropriate classrooms. Last story, I remember when we were about halfway through this, I went to visit the Bronx Library Center, uh, and I remember Michael Alvarez, who I'm shocked is about to retire, um, showing me around, and we get, we turn a corner, 
and he starts apologizing for the fact that there's a class, a class, I think it was English language class, that's taking place literally in a hallway because we've run out of space. And I had to assure him that there was nothing to apologize for, that that was the best thing I'd seen ever. And, you know, we, we keep going. Yeah. So uh, uh, before I turn it back over to Chair uh, Manchaco, I think as a, a final question or two, um, uh, you know, I think the Adult Learning Center's piece is such an important uh, function here. Um, and I am reminded that uh, about 20 years ago, uh, when I worked at the Queens Public Library, we celebrated the formation of the Friends Group, the first ever Friends Group, at the Steinway Adult Learning Center in Astoria, and at the charter ceremony for the Friends chapter, um, several of the students um, who formed the board spoke. And I remember uh, a woman saying that she uh, came to Astoria, Queens, and didn't know uh, any English and didn't really know anyone else. Uh, but in walking around the streets, was able to meet someone who she could communicate with and she said, I, I don't know where to go or what to do to figure out what I'm gonna do here. And, and the woman said to her, go to the library. If you go to the library, they will help you and they will teach you how to speak English. And, and she said, that's exactly what I did. I walked right up into that library, found the Steinway Adult Learning Center and, uh, and she learned how to speak English, and, and she gave a speech that night, which uh, brought many of us to tears. And I think that's uh, uh, another one of the million stories that you could tell about the public libraries and the work that you do uh, for and with immigrant <laughs> communities. So, um, so thank you, and I know we can and should always do more. And uh, we've done some really good things in terms of funding mm -hmm. over the last uh, several years. Obviously, we want to keep that progress and momentum going, but. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that story and that, that real recommitment to civic engagement, but also civic education, and that happens in our libraries. And one of the most uh, exciting, so many exciting programs, but one that touches me even more deeply is participatory budgeting. And a lot of that work is and has been happening in our communities through our district offices and our district uh, engagement, which is a voluntary process right now, but there's this big citywide thing as well. And maybe this is a question to Moya as well, as the libraries, what, what um, and, and because immigrant communities um, find it as a way to engage with power to make decisions about the budget, and the libraries have been a big um, partner for us. And so talk a little bit about PB, participatory budgeting, and any future work that is coming down from the mayor's office in terms of their process and what you've learned so far, how you're getting invited to that uh, work, and any, any insight that the mayor's office of immigrant affairs or the libraries can kind of give us um, for, on that topic. As the, as the writing... No, no, I mean, let me talk about PB for a second because I think PB has been a lifeblood of our local library branches in that uh, I think through the respect of those branches and through uh, the involvement of the local council member as well, um, the relationship has been very strong and that we've benefited. I mean, we can give you an exact breakdown of the libraries that have benefited from participatory budgeting, um, but I can tell you we are always getting feedback about the participation level of people selecting libraries with very specific detailed projects, and we try to honor that commitment as far as the money that's been allocated through participatory budgeting. So, I mean, I can get you, I'm not sure if they have it, but I can get you more detailed information on how we've benefited. And that's the, that's the council side. Uh, anything that's coming down in terms of information about the citywide uh, process that is uh, by the charter supposed to kind of launch in July? Anybody have both of those things? Both the current city council project, PB initiative, and then the citywide stuff. I, I mean, I'm one of the ways that um, sort of two sides of the coin, of course, we benefit when libraries um, are allocated funds through P um, 
participatory budgeting, uh, but also we make sure the libraries are there for specific council people who want to hold meetings mm -hmm. about the process. Um, so it's a place where people can come and learn about what their responsibility and, and their rights are. Um, Mr. Chairman, so of course we're, we're involved with uh, PB and, and uh, we're grateful for, for that and for the, not just for the funding but for the way in which that channels the sort of democratic sense of engagement of the citizenry and empowers them. Um, we, uh, in terms of civics more generally, I just want to say a word there, as we have moved now into the census, we've uh, created a manager for civic engagement and community partnerships as part of the census work and we want to build from that. Um, and we actually, uh, uh, we have a new chief uh, uh, branch library officer. Um, Carol is here, who was the interim chief. And through her, uh, through her guidance and now Brian, working together with Brian, um, we're actually, this is a live issue right now, which is how can the libraries go the next level of helping the next generation understand how our systems work and how they can make them work for them. Um, so, for instance, we've been learning about the Los Angeles uh, Public Library, which creates teen councils in branches, and instead of having them advise on what color paint for the walls, they, they pick a local problem, um, a park that's in bad shape or, you know, whatever it is, and actually try to solve the problem. So rather than sort of lecture them about like here are the three branches of government, which is a rough sell, said the former political science professor. The, um, it's, it's, okay, let's learn how the system works by actually making it work. Um, and, and so we're looking at those issues and, and my guess is we will be launching more initiatives of that kind. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I think that that, that kind of settles my, my curiosity around participatory budgeting, uh, but the, if the mayor's office has anything to say about the citywide work and really thinking about how immigrants and libraries connect to this larger, uh, now city charter mandated thing, if there's anything that you've been working on so far. So we're excited about it, but I have to get you more details on the plan. Okay, so we'll come back to you on that. We'll put a, we'll put a request in for, for more information there. And just thank you all for the work and dedication you have for our communities, um, all our communities, and today's specific focus on immigrants and libraries. So I just want to say hey, thank you and thank you to the chair uh, for that. Thank you. Do you want to close it out? Go ahead. Thank you all very much. We will obviously uh, be hearing from you uh, again as we enter the new year and go into a new budget cycle. But uh, uh, I want to thank uh, my co-chair for his uh, love of libraries and his lunchbox story, which was absolutely adorable. <laughs> With that, we are adjourned. You want these or no? No, thank you. You good?